Namaste. I hope you're all doing well and are keeping safe. Welcome to the Festival of Bharat. As you all know, we are committed to bringing you content that is dharmic in intent, energy, and spirit. Our aim is to keep the torch of Sanatan Dharm blazing high and proud. Our guest today is an erudite author with a keen interest in ancient Indian history and Sanskrit literature. Sumedha Varma Ojaji joined the Indian Civil Services in 1992, but switched careers after a sabbatical in 2006, moving to writing books and international consultancy with United Nations organizations. She has been engaged in deep research on ancient Indian history and Sanskrit and Prakrit works for the past decade and a half. Sumedha ji works in the area of translating and explaining the epics and bringing ancient Sanskrit Prakrit literature to the modern world. She also works in the area of conservation of cultural heritage with a focus on intangible heritage of oral traditions. The Los Angeles library system has accredited, accredited her as an author and part of its South Asian outreach. Her translation of the Sanskrit Valmiki Ramayana was published in 2016. Unabi is a book series by her that is set in the Mauryan period based on the Arthashastra of Ch Chanakya. Unabi is also being developed as a web series. So please join me in welcoming Sumedha Varma Odaji. Namaste Pujita and namaste to everyone who's listening or watching this. It's entirely my pleasure to be here, to be able to talk to you about what I do and uh, you know to disseminate it amongst people. So I stopped being a bureaucrat and started being an author and speaker precisely for this reason. So thank you very much for calling me and thank you for the conversation. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, you're based out of Switzerland because of your work with the United Nations. Is that right? That's right. Uh, although I must add that after 2018, after my last stint at the FAO in Rome, I decided that I was going to concentrate only on writing and speaking and ancient India. So I have now stopped working for the UN after about 10, 15 years. So I've had one stint as an Indian bureaucrat, another stint as an international bureaucrat. And now I want to just write, speak and research. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, so your, uh, since we've spoken of your interest in ancient India and ancient Indian history, uh, and you, your specific work, uh, which is, you know, which is kind of not, I wouldn't say restricted, but concentrates or focus okay. on, focuses on the Mauryan, uh, Mauryan period. Uh, my question is, why did you choose the Mauryan period, uh, considering the long, uh, you know, the long uh, timeline of Indian history? Why not say the Guptas or the Cholas or whatever? What, what, why Mauryans? That's a very good question, you know, because we Indians are spoiled for choice. Wherever we look, there are fascinating stories, fascinating histories to research and to talk about and to uh, spread amongst people. But why the modern? So that's there's, there's a double answer to this. One is personal and the other is more national. So the personal one, of course, is that I was born on the banks of the river Ganga. So I was born in Patna, ancient Patliput. So you can imagine that I grew up with stories of the Mauryans, of Magad, of Chanakya, of Chandrapur. So that is the personal part of it. But there's more than that. Why the Mauryans? And I have written extensively on this in many of the magazines, etc., where I write historical columns. The shape of Bharat as it is today, the prototype of that Bharat was given by the Mauryans. Now, Bharat is a very ancient civilization. We cannot say in any way that it started at this point or that point. But the way in which the nation state has been envisaged, the geographical area, the multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multi-regional polity, the different constituent elements of the state. Say, for example, take the symbol of modern India. That symbol of modern India, those four snarling lions, mm. they are taken from the Mauryans. It's a Mauryan symbol. Take the peacock. The peacock was a Mauryan uh, national. It is our national bird today and the peacock was a national animal. Mm. Take our trade routes. Right. You know, the Uttar Path and the Dakshin Path were 
for the first time really set in place and exploited by the Mauryans. And we have our NH1 running along what we would call the Uttarpat. Hmm. Take the word Rupia, take the name of our currency. Hmm. It comes from what Cotillier called money. You know, he called it beautiful, Rupia. That is where Rupia comes from. Wow. I could go on and on. The short point is that the Mauryans were what we can call the first empire mm. of Bharat as it is today. Now there are six or seven countries out of that same geographical area. But Chandragupta's empire was from Afghanistan to Madurai, from Saurashtra to Bangladesh. And that is, you know, more or less where we are at today. Well, barring a few other countries which have been carved out, the base remains the same. And so many of the things that we follow today, you know, we tend not to go back right into the past where we should look for the roots. Mm -hmm. Some people are very fond of stopping at the Mughals or the Timurids. Some people are very fond of stopping at different places that they like. But I think when we are searching for our roots, we have to go as far back as the evidence allows and mm -hmm. look for as many similarities as is possible. Mm -hmm. So for me, we are the modern Mauryans and the Mauryans are ancient Bharat. So my interest in them, the more I research them, the more I find them interesting. Also, you mentioned the Guptas or the Cholas or say even a few of the Muslim rulers. You know, the idea of kingship in India has always been that of the Mauryans. Why do you think so many of the Guptas call themselves Chandragupta? Mm. Why do you think so many of the Ashokan pillars of the Mauryan pillars were uprooted by so many people and brought to their own uh, kingdoms, Vero Shakugla, for example, because they wanted to partake of that Mauryan glory, uh, glory and uh, the concept, the political concept of sovereignty mm. that the Mauryans first put into place, giving Bharat the structure, more or less, that it has today. Mm. Beautiful. Um, so, so therefore, yeah, I guess, I guess what you're saying is, uh, I guess it was the very first iconic sort of, um, also, um, uh, something that set the path for the, uh, exactly. other kingdoms, other dynasty, exactly. dynastic exactly. rule, uh, exactly. kind of set the precepts in place for them to follow also. Yes, exactly. You know, the administrative structure, for example, if you look at the Gupta administrative structure and the Mauryan one, there are so many similarities. Mm. Beautiful. So that's exactly, you put it in a simple sentence that it uh, set the path. Mm. Um, your book, the Urnabhi, Urnabhi, am I pronouncing it correctly? Urnabhi. <laughs> Urnabhi. 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 Yes. Urnabhi is, uh, it's kind of this book series, really. Yes, uh, it is a book series. And here, you know, we have, I have both. Yes, of them. please do show us the cover, the book. This is, yeah. this is book one. And this, yeah. is book two. this was published a few years earlier and this is the one which has been published in april recently right recently, yeah um this is you this was uh, i mean you developed it or you're developing it as a book series so can you tell us more about uh how you conceived of it uh, did it uh, did you plan it as a book series or it just happened that you had so much material so you just thought okay let me you know, how, how did that work out? Uh, how did how did you come up with that one? Well, uh, Poojita, when I wrote this book in the first place, I was not even very certain about whether it's going to get published or not. <laughs> because uh, like, uh, I, I mean, you read my bio. So I was here on a couple of years sabbatical with my husband. I wrote the right. book. I didn't know any publishers. And there's an interesting story about how Roly Books and I actually found each other without mm. ever meeting because... Mm to somebody on Facebook, we found each other and the book was published. Oh, so uh, that's quite a, a story of serendipity. And uh, lucky for me, and uh, it worked out really well for me. So I was not very certain of what the response would be. Mm. Because you see this kind of historical fiction, nobody mm. writes this. Mm. Because this is an amalgamation of a very great degree of serious research. Mm. Because I would Whatever I write in this book, I can back up with evidence, evidence. The historical part. Remember, this is historical fiction. So the historical part is almost like a history book. So it was there space for serious historical fiction? That was the question I was asking myself. Because in earlier years, when I had had the idea of writing this and I went to some other publishers, the response was very, you know, offhand. Who wants to read about Chandragupta Maurya? Please write about something topical. Sure. You know, this was about 10, 15 years ago. 
so it was a gamble for mm. me and it was a gamble for holy books but the response was phenomenal for this very i've tried to make it as interesting as possible but you know it is not um, frivolous fiction mm. it is serious fiction so my idea was always to keep writing about the morians mm. two of them have already been written and i'm writing the third one which is called the waters of the morians the, what is my, the third, again the third one the waters of the morians you know the morians are called as a hydraulic civilization okay their entire existence and their entire prosperity depended on water Hmm. how did they, how did they control water for irrigation for uh, daily use etc there was a very hmm. big administrative uh, tantra behind it so i in the next book i am going to explore the importance of water and you know another story about the morians is that there was a 12 year drought because of this 12 year drought chandragupta the morya his mind was completely taken off material things and sovereignty and rulership and he gave up everything and became a jain monk mm yeah the morian empire has passed through the water stress test mm i am not going to write about that drought in this book 3 but as the series goes on and i may be move on to the later kings probably i will not because i am no admirer of ashok Hmm. <laughs> my series will continue only with the Chandragupta Maurya, but yes, in my mind, it was always a series. Hmm. In my mind, I have uh, you know, I love reading series. I feel you build up a world, and then you populate that world, and then everyone wants to know what's going on with the people in that world. Correct, correct. It's so kind of like a, a historical, uh, historical Malgudi days. <laughs> yes, why not? <laughs> I mean that's that's a, a a wonderful company to be in. I yes. cannot aspire to be like that, but yes, that's the idea. Right. Um, so you you just I couldn't help uh, but notice that you uh, I mean you mentioned and it caught my attention. You 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 mentioned that you're no fan of uh, Ashoka. No, um, I'm not. Why do you say that? Well, because I think that very very unfairly. all the work that was done by chandragupta maurya is ascribed to ashok mm. and that is really really unfair ashok was kind of you know a pampered princeling mm. and an aggressive princeling who got the empire from his grandfather and his father correct we know very little about bindusar except mm-hmm. for uh, little bits from greek history and whatever we know we know that he was a fierce warrior a fierce mm. fighter a very very valorous king mm. about chandragupta maurya we know a lot Mm. and he was the one who actually established this empire ashok merely inherited it he was the sure. well, karan johar of his times <laughs> and then, you know kind of made a he didn't do very well with it yes because it fell to pieces just a few decades after his death it fell to pieces he was uh, you know he lived to a great old age and a terrible old age mm. he became powerless in the end and uh, the mauryan empire was not served well by ashok in fact if i were to write the decline and fall of the mauryan empire well ashok would be the hero over there so <laughs> i feel that the achievements of the mauryan empire are not the achievements of ashok they are the achievements of chandragupta maurya mm-hmm. and you know this kind of peculiar obsession of white western indologists with buddhism they have inflated his ideas about buddhism now i am not disagreeing that mm. he was a buddhist he did become a buddhist and he did give a lot of uh, importance to spreading buddhism around the world but we must remember that it was not an either or situation at mm. the same time sanatan dharma jainism ajiviks so many other sects they were all also prospering and thriving and being patronized by the moderns themselves So Correct. Ashok did not patronize only Buddhism. He patronized everyone. Such were the Mauryan kings. Mm. Chandragupta became a Jain, but he also patronized Sanatan Dharma. The Correct. same for Bindusar. Bindusar is very, uh, you know, one of the stories about him is that he was very much into Greek philosophy mm-hmm. and Greek religion. But that did not mean that what was happening in India, what was happening with Sanatan Dharma, was something bad. So mm. we must not live with, you know, this is that kind of very. monotheistic and very crusader like attitude it's either or it was all oh, like correct that. correct everything went together mm. and ashok has been needlessly lionized mm. by 
people who have not understood the nature of buddhism and the relationship between buddhism and sanatan dharma mm. they love to hope it as a reform of sanatan correct. Dharma, correct. as a reform of as a, yes yes yeah. and you know ashok is nothing but the greek emperor uh, uh, the roman emperor constantine so mm. the same as constantine spread christianity, christianity. on ashok that okay now ashok spread buddhism all around so you know these kind of parallels were there in the head of all those christian people who were mm. researching uh, whatever happened in india and they were the ones who decided to who got to write the story correct so this is the story they've written i don't buy this story at all <laughs> nice so, uh, so well he is never been a favorite of mine and will not be but i will continue to write about the morins perhaps i will write a book about a show where mm. you know he'll be the villain hmm Not nice, nice. Um, yeah, I think this thing about um, Ashok, a, a lot of lot of facts are coming to the fore about uh, um, kings and rulers who have been lionized, who have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, made made. Uh, and I'd just like to add uh, one thing here, Pujita, if you'll just permit me. the inscriptions on the pillars which have been found in the modern domain are very very uh, popular and all of them are supposed to have been written by ashok during his time mm -hmm. now there are certain other independent sources of research which date those pillars to a time much before the morins oh. so the inscriptions could have been written by ashok yes but those pillars belong to a time much before the morins there are research papers by somebody called john irwin in case any of your uh, mm -hmm. listeners or viewers are interested i can give the references so those pillars already existed now let's get to the inscriptions themselves what is written in that now if you read these people who lionize ashok it is a totally new way of looking at kingship where the king was to look after the welfare of his subjects that's what ashok is famous for then pray what about you know i have this book all the time with me what about this book you know you can draw a parallel mm. between what is written in those in shastras this is the art shastra so you can draw parallels and i intend to write an article on this the mm. concepts of welfare administration running the kingdom that are there in the inscriptions mm. of so called ashokan inscriptions i mean can all be sourced back to the arthashastra oh. and what is the arthashastra if not uh, the essence of the political principles of this nation hmm. the arthashastra itself is also not stand alone it is part of a tradition which comes from so many so many years ago Correct. from the mahabharat Correct. from so many other texts so this lionizing of ashok is something which i feel is completely not on Hmm. So obviously, I mean, I would never write anything about him. <laughs> um, you mentioned the Artha Shastra. In fact, my next question was on the uh, because you've you've also spoken about it uh, extensively. Uh, the in particularly the Saptanga state, the theory of the Saptanga state, which as a policy was uh, was uh, popularized. I don't think uh, Kautilya or Chanakya uh, initiated it or founded it, but I think he popularized it. um so could could you walk us through this this concept this yes so you know uh, the saptang state is the indian concept of the nation state this concept as you say is very old and mm. you will find it everywhere you read the mahabharat you will find it you read the durga saptashati you will find it you read, read the lalita sahasra naam you will find it why how because there are seven elements of the state swami that is the king amartya that is administration janpat that is the land and the people then you have the durg that is the fort you have dand that is the army you have kosh that is the treasury and you have mitra that is international relations six of these are inward looking towards the nation state itself and how to run this nation state and uh, how to organize this nation state this is these six elements so you can see that you have all all the things which are necessary leadership you have finances you have security you have administration organization etc everything and the mm. seventh one is because no country is an island you know you live in a world and there are lots and lots of countries around you so how do you deal with them mm. that is mitra mm. 
this is the Saptanga state. Hmm. And this is the order in which Kautilya writes of the Saptanga state in his compendium, the Arthashastra. Right. However, these seven elements have been found throughout Indic intellectual uh, traditions. Hmm. The interesting thing is that the importance of each differs. How do we know the importance? It is in the way they are mentioned. So Kautilya says, Swami, Amatya. So the importance decreases as you go down the list. I'll just give you a small example. There is a, a lady called Sulabha who appears in the Mahabharata. There is a Sulabha Janak Samvad. She mm. is an amazing person, a role model, I think, who everyone should know about. Correct. There are so many things about Sulabha, but the relevant thing here is that she also speaks of this Saptanga state in that dialogue with Janak. Mm. But interestingly, her order is different. The importance she gives to the different elements are different. And so if you read uh, different people in the Arthashastra itself, about 16 other schools of thought have been mentioned. Mm -hmm. So he mentions, you know, that this and this person says this, this person says this. However, I say this. Mm -hmm. I dis disagree with all these schools. Or if he agrees, he says, yes, I agree with all these people. So it was not some standalone thing. It was a whole school of thought. It, mm -hmm. was, it was the political science it is the political science of our own, which has come out from our own Bharat. Mm. And I think it is imperative to go back to that kind of understanding because it's completely 360 degree. There is no element of the state which is missing. If you look at political science theorists, you know, very important ones, American ones and English ones, and you look at whatever resources they think are important and what how they talk about the state, and then you compare it with Cotillion. Cotillier is more comprehensive, not less. Mm -hmm. And the ways that he has devised, you know, I also do some uh, few strategic talks. Mm -hmm. So geostrategy in Cotillier is unmatched. And I'm working right now on uh, mapping the current political, uh, the current geopolitical international situation mm -hmm. on Mitra of Cotillier. And it is just fascinating to see how appropriate, focused and Clarity giving this tool is. Wow. So the Saptang state concept is something that needs to be adopted and understood by us. We need to analyze ourselves mm. and other states using the ideas of these seven elements. When it's going to happen is anybody's guess. Because when I talk to people, their normal response is that there was no political science in India. Mm. There was no theorizing about political science in India. And I have people who actually say this. And I'm struck dumb for a moment. And I really don't know how to answer them. Because yeah. you, know, you can't, if somebody is uh, asleep, you can awaken them. But if they are awake, you cannot awaken them any further. Any further. Um, you mentioned that you've also uh, undertaken research in trying to understand or to see how the lens of the Saptanga state theory can be applied to the geopolitics scenario in the world today. Uh, what are your findings? Can you just uh, maybe share some thoughts on that? Oh my goodness, you'll have to give me a couple of hours, Fujita. Okay. <laughs> this, is something, <laughs> this is something which I have been working on very hard. Okay, but jokes apart. Yes. The thing is that uh, Kautilya has two ways in which he has envisaged Mitra, as in the countries which are around you. So uh, there, the first one is that there are 12 sets or uh, there are 12 relationships. Often they have been understood as, you know, uh, 12 nation states as in one, two, three, four, and specific names of those nation states mm -hmm. around the modern period. Mm -hmm. However, it is more the kind of relationships. So there are 12 kind of relationships that you can have with countries around you. And right. these are, you know, like normal. Uh, one of them is, say, for example, Mitra. Another mm -hmm. one is Ari. Another one is Madhyam. Madhyam mm -hmm. is the buffer state. Another one is Udasin. Mm -hmm. Udasin is the big country very far away from you who doesn't mm -hmm. want to eat here. So these are 12 relationships and there are things like, you know, enemy in the rear, the friend of the enemy in the rear, the enemy in front, friend of the enemy in front, and all of them have proper Sanskrit names. Wow. However, I am not focusing on this one. There is another set, another way of envisaging international relations mm -hmm. given by Kautilya himself in the same book, in the same Adhikaran, in which he looks at four groupings. Hmm. And these four groupings are of three relationships each. 
Hmm. So the first one is the Vijig issue. Who is the Vijig issue? Us, the person we are trying to analyze, the world conqueror. So today, you know, we are not conquering any worlds. Today, it is achievement of our geopolitical objectives, a proper equilibrium of our risks, opportunities, threats, etc. So that's what the Vijig issue does. In other words, the national interest. Hmm. The most ubiquitous thing, the national interest. Yeah. Now, this Vijig issue has one Mitra and one Mitra Mitra. So, this is three. The second group is your enemy, your Ari. Ari also has a Mitra and a Mitra Mitra, another mm -hmm. three. The next is the Madhyam or the buffer state, which is large and which kind of buffers you from your enemy. Again, the Madhyam has, an, has a Mitra and a Mitra Mitra, that's another three. And the last is the Udasi. Again, with a Mitra and a Mitra Mitra. So how many are there? There are 12. 12. I have actually, I am now mapping today's plurilateral groupings, such as the Quad and the IPEF, mm. onto all this. And I can tell you that the insights that this throws up, and mm. when you keep the focus of the Vijig issue or the national interest in your mind, the way in which you can understand the ramifications and the place of each and every country which is there mm. in the scheme of things, it's just amazing. The clarity is amazing. Hmm. So uh, let's see where this goes. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, especially since we are living in times that are, um, uh, you know, that are so um, complicated, critical, very complicated. Yes, yes, complicated. And it is so critical to know who your enemies and who your friends are, you know, and more importantly, uh, who to ally with and who to um, maybe jettison at <laughs> the right time. And Pujita also, the alliances, friendships and enmities keep changing as the issues change. Correct. Inside the quad, the US may be our friend. Yes. Outside the quad, it may be our enemy. Correct. Very true. Very so, true. Uh, you know, you have to make these different uh, mappings for each issue. Yes. And yes. then consider it comprehensively. So mm. I just wish that in our foreign service academies, somebody would study the Arthashastra properly. <laughs> Let's see. You oh. know, um, now that you mention it, uh, this is uh, another question very relevant to my next follow-up question, which is, um, uh, you know, to do with the fact that um, as, as regards the Amatya class, for example, is uh, according to Kautilya, do you think we are lacking in a a uh, very strong intellectual class that uh, can advise the king the or say the the swamin in this case the ruler or the prime minister or whatever. I agree with you Pujita. I think our administration Amatya the second element of the state is very much wanting mm. in the kind of uh, training it has the selection perhaps I don't know I have taken the UPSC myself and I don't understand what was the relevance of the stuff that I had written to any of the work that I had to do. There was no relevance. <laughs> you know, my subjects were geography and economics. Hmm. So uh, I don't understand what was the relevance of physical geography hmm. to the work that I did as an Indian Revenue Service officer. Correct. None. And uh, suppose you become an Indian Audit and Account Service officer or you become an IAS. What is the relevance of these things? Correct. So the selection process itself, I think, needs to be tweaked in some way. Mm. Then after that, also uh, the the training, mm. the kind of training that needs to be given. And I will hark back to national interest. Mm. Perhaps every bureaucrat should be taught. And, you know, we do take an oath, by the way. Mm. When okay. we join the civil services, we take an oath to serve the nation. Okay. But it's a kind of, you know, anodyne oath that I, I will mm. take, you know, uh, work for the nation and not do anything against it, that kind of thing. Perhaps it needs to be made a little more specific about how to uphold the national interest in each and every case. Right. Having said that, it is true that the Amartya class or the administration hmm. comes from the same population from all of us, from in between all of us. So the same kind of people which are there in society are going to be there in the administration. So I think hmm. we'll also have to do some introspection. Do we have, do we care enough for the national interest or we do we care for our own selfish interest? Exactly. How, posting, exactly. how much money I am making, you know, what kind of house I am getting, etc, etc. Do mm. I care more for that or do I care for the national interest? So it's easy to blame any group of people, but we must introspect. The administration is just people who are part of us. They just took an exam and went there. Correct. <laughs> Very true. Very no. true. So the same thing, same problems which are there in all of us today will be reflected. 
Correct. Having said which, I think the selection and the training process and what they are taught. For instance, for the people who are in the Indian Foreign Service, why are there no indigenous Indic texts taught? Exactly. exactly. No answer to that. Although, oh no, there is an answer to that. So in 1947, Nehru decided that this would not be done. Because all these texts were, according to him, Brahmanical, Sanskrit, and they were only fit for throwing into the dustbin. So it is only, say, in the last 10 or 12 years, I would say 10, 15 years, that certain academies and certain uh, think tanks and research groups, IDSA is one of them, the Manohar Parker IDSA, hmm. which has started doing some excellent work on hmm. the Arthashastra, but they don't have that kind of in-depth knowledge because for that, you need people who know Sanskrit. Correct. Correct. The combining of knowledge of Sanskrit with modern subjects and uh, this kind of amalgamation so that we can use it for our own benefit is the crying need of the art. Very true. And uh, if this is very pertinent, Sumedha ji, because you have been in the bureaucracy yourself. Um, and uh, since we're talking about matters of the state and so on, uh, uh, what you said about the manner in which uh, the the, sel the selection process, for example, uh, it's kind of like how we're churning out engineers, how we're churning out, we're churning out people, we're churning out, um, you know, um, professionals, um, like, you know, a, an assembly line, it's kind of like an assembly line production. So, um, if, if, for example, there was a recent controversy over how uh, certain coaching centers the kind of material that is being, I'm sure you're aware of, uh, you know, the recent controversy that uh, broke out about uh, how uh, controversial some of the things that were being taught in these coach coaching centers were. So there's a lot to be desired, actually, in terms of, uh, because these are the and people. You know, who are, Jika, we'll have to go back a little bit more. What about our education? Hmm. True. Because exactly. that's where workers come from. I have graduated in economics from Lady Sri Ram. So I have gone through a certain course of study. Yeah. I have actually uh, done my ISC and ICSC. So, you know, that is the Frank yeah. Anthony board. That is that board, which colonial. is... Right? You, As colonial. I am not brainwashed and indoctrinated. It's a miracle. Exactly. <laughs> true, true. Very true. Um, so anyway, um, in this um, uh, Saptanga state uh, theory, uh, and of course, in the study of Arthashastra that you've uh, pursued so um, uh, dedicatedly, um, I remember you mentioning somewhere the role of the queen and the, the queen and the queen mother, right, in, in as part of the Amate class, as the advisory, um, uh, in the advisory capacity to the king. Yes, as counselors. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk more about that? Because I think it's important to uh, break the myth that a lot of people have, especially in the West and in India, of course, that Indians, Indian women always, except for Rani Lakshmi Bhai or the, you know, uh, the, the known three, four names that people know of, people don't really, under people underestimate the role of the woman in uh, uh, matters of the state uh, oh, in so. Indian history. Very much so. So if we look at the Arthashastra, so there is a list of, uh, you know, the Arthashas is kind of like an encyclopedia of ancient India, of, of a state, everything that happens there. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a list of salaries which has to be given to everyone. So everyone wow. receives salaries. The queen and the queen mother also receive salaries. Oh. The prince receives some salary. There's a long list down to the lowest, you know, kind of um, water boy. The salaries <laughs> of each person are given by Cotillier. So he had a mind, I think, which was which took in the most comprehensive view as well as the most tiny micro view. So from macro to micro, everything is there. Hmm. The queen and the queen mother are part of the inner council hmm. of the king. So they are the ones who give him the most uh, important, they advise on the most important thing. So there, there is a council of ministers, which is the mantris. Mm. And uh, there were uh, about 36 odd departments and mantris in the modern, uh, in the Arthashastra. Mm. Other than the mantris, there are the mantrinos. Mm. And the mantrinos are the most important ones. And those mantrinos will be the Rajpurohit, the Senapati, the Queen Mother, Mm. the queen, perhaps the Yuvraj. So these are one step above mm. the mantras. The most important things will be debated here. 
and mm. then it goes to the entire council of ministers and it, it's a very kind of uh, you know consensus building kind of approach oh. which is something again uh, you know i i want to make this point which i have made in various articles mm. that the indian concept of kingship and sovereignty is not that you know like the red queen of alice in wonderland off with his head if i don't like him <laughs> it's a very very consensus based thing so issues are discussed and everyone's opinion is taken if the rajpurohit or the senapati or the treasurer if anyone says anything that is considered yes the last decision the final decision belongs mm -hmm. to the swami or the king but he takes into account the advice of the mantri knows as well as the mantris mm. and in these mantris and mantri knows are the queen and the queen mother mm. regarding the position of women now this is another uh, area of work that i do pujita and uh, not only do i write on this i am also part of an organization called indica i am the esg member for gender and right. we run a number of research projects mm. on researching on indic femininity hmm. of the past and of the present and the idea is just that to break the myth of the backwardness and the regression of women in the past Correct. so women in the past were educated they were powerful they had status they could perform rituals they were very important members of society Mm. and there are so many ways so many examples that i can give you maybe i can give one from my own book yes so the yes. protagonist of my book is a ganika so a ganika is a courtesan deluxe not to be confused with a, a kind of run of the mill uh, group jivika or prostitute as Correct. we call it now so she is somebody who is well versed in the 64 arts in the ved vedang the chaturdash vidyasthanam and she has ha, holds a very important role in the society and mm. polity of the nation so she does political stuff for the king she mm. may act as a spy. spy she may act as a diplomat you know if there's something to be some message to be conveyed to a king of the next kingdom then she may go there so she was in the thick of politics mm. so she was in the thick of decision making of policy making of carrying out the things that the king and the council of ministers wanted her to do in my case this gadika her name is mr kesi she becomes a spy mm. in the play of chanakya and since my first book dealt with chandragupta just on the throne mm. of magadha with just about half of india half of bharat under his control and how he extended it up till uh, what is now pakistan mm. and down till madurai and saurashtra and you know in the bangladesh was called chandraketu gadh at the time so how did he extend it till all these four areas of the north south east west what was the role of chanakya's spy system what was the role of mr kc is of course a fictional character hmm. uh, she has some literary antecedents but she is a fictional character but if you read the book then hmm. you will realize the role of women and in book 2 not only is mr kc there Hmm. but uh, you know uh, the modern senapati is called agni mitra hmm. there is also an important role of his wife in hmm. taking certain crucial decisions hmm. the people that he relies on include his wife hmm. there is a sunga uh, gansang and there is a group of advisors but there is also his wife so if you read the books then you will be able to see in action as it were the results of all the research i have done on women Mm. to know where they stood and i have brought all this out in these books it mm. is a kind of essence it is a kind of you know the juice from all the research that i have done and my next book is actually going to be the modern women of ancient india when i am where i am it's non fiction it should hopefully come out next year again from roli books and i'm going to discuss 12 to 14 ancient indian female role models lovely so the are these um, uh, uh, people that you've read about uh, during your research or is there any particular this is actually relating to my next question which is about um, you know you research what kind of research do you how do you go about it it must be i'm sure uh, very very arduous because uh, you know locating the books uh, going to the right places how do you know where you're going to find them uh, and then you know it must be quite a hunt more like a like like a treasure hunt so i would like to know a little bit more about your research 
and uh, maybe you could also you know give advice to uh, aspiring writers um, like myself uh, mm -hmm. as to how to go about it <laughs> so uh, see if you want to write about history in my opinion you have to go back to primary sources right primary sources are of various kinds in our country we have a huge huge collection of texts in many different languages the oldest texts are in sanskrit and tamil but there are texts in so many prakrit languages in so many other modern indian languages of india so whatever you are trying to write about say you know if you are going to write about tamil nadu you have to read tamil texts exactly you have to read the if it's the past you have to read sangam literature if it's not the past say it is the period of the cholas then you have to read what is the second source mm. of uh, primary evidence inscriptions in tamil nadu there is a treasure trove of temple inscriptions actually across the country but the cholas are very special so right. uh, the second source is inscriptions so you have to read these inscriptions and you have to examine whatever archaeological remains are there read the reports by maybe the archaeological survey of india or the state archaeological unit or even some uh, scholars go there and you know research and write on their own so read those reports then another uh, very important source so we have texts we have archaeological remains and we have epigraphy the fourth is numismatics look so at the points numismatics points okay numismatics statics okay so if you read book 1 there is a huge plot point which turns on points and the way they were made and the symbols which were there on them so for that i did a lot of research on numismatics morian coins nand the coins what was the difference between them what was their composition how were they made so all these things are available mm. if you go to primary sources and read them mm. another source that we have which has to be used a little carefully Hmm. is also folk history or oral history right. now it depends on what you are going to write suppose you want to write about the medieval period say in bihar or punjab or up you know then there is this uh, this whole set of songs called alha udal now alha udal is a musical expression of history hmm. but there is all there are also facts in it then what is there it again? what is it called this so these, uh, are, these, these are just songs these songs are called alha udal alha udal okay yeah and there are i mean i would say there are hundreds thousands of examples like this like we've all heard of prithvi raj raso but yes. raso is a kind of poem so there are poem, so many yeah. rasos and rasaus the two of them are different so all these oral histories are also there for analysis we cannot take them pick them up you know as it is we have mm. to corroborate them with mm. kind of third party or whatever evidence is uh, over so whichever part of the country you are trying to write about read in the language of that part that, of the country mm. do not do not do not rely on secondary sources mm. after you have got some grip on primary sources then you can start reading you know history books by x y or z i also mm. have a couple of history like for example lokinder singh mm. she has written a book on ancient and medieval history which is fair enough one of her books not all of them the one uh, which she has written up till the 12th century ancient and medieval india is a fair enough collection of many descriptions of primary sources hmm. but you should not read her opinion on it you go back and read the primary source yourself for that what do you need to do you need hmm. to know the language Correct. learn sanskrit learn tamil learn telugu learn odia learn bengali so this is uh, the thing is pujita i don't think there are any shortcuts And I don't think my advice is going to be very palatable to many people who want to, you know, write uh, a bestseller in four months. Correct, correct, correct. You know that's not the way I operate. For me, it's more important, most important, to get your facts correct. Correct. Very true. Uh, so my emphasis in one sentence would be on primary sources. Primary. Do not go for secondary sources. Primary sources uh, primarily would be in what the archival uh, archives, uh, state yes. archives, or national archives. No, no. Uh, but other than that, you know, for example, say, let me talk about the Mauryan period because hmm. that's what I research. Correct. So, what are the primary sources? The primary sources in this are a lot of texts in Sanskrit. Hmm. So, suppose I want to know that okay, Mr. K C is a dancing girl. She is a dancer. So, how would she have danced? So, what will I do? I will go and read the Natya Shastra of Bharat Muni. 
Hmm. So it was written during that time, and it is a whole manual of dance. Yes. If I want to know the financial uh, arrangements or financial administration, I will read the Arthi Shastra because it gives you all that. So in our own Indic um, intellectual tradition, there is a manual for everything. Everything. So you read that manual. You, now, suppose, I, for example, I want to know, I want to describe that some festival was going on in the Mauryan period. So say Basantotsa. Now, how do I know? What happened during the Basantotsa? What was done? So again, there is something called the Atharva Parishisht. Oh, it yeah. is a Parishisht of the Atharva. This gives you the roots, the beginnings of all the festivals that we celebrate across the country, whether it be Durga Puja or whether it be Basantotsa, whatever. And this, I'm just giving you a few examples. There are many other such examples for each subject, for each topic. You will get a lot of manuals in many, you know, uh, different kind of uh, areas, regions, languages. For example, uh, there is a book called the Manasullas. Now, I don't, yeah, I, I cannot read it in the original because I don't know the language, but it's an 11th century text. So if you are writing about that area, that time, read the Manasullas. Now, how to start and how to know what to read, that's a very good question, Pooja. Yes. About, yes. you know, how to start. So for that, maybe I would say you can take some uh, more trustworthy kind of book. I would recommend maybe Upinder Singh. She does give a list of primary sources. Correct. Otherwise, you need Sanjeev Sanyal. Yes. You will also give a list of primary sources. Correct. Well, I'm hoping to write a short, simple history book myself. In a couple of years so then i will also give a lot of uh, lists lovely lovely Start with those. and uh, there's no there's no shortcut in my thinking yes. there's, no shortcut. there's no shortcut no i agree i agree i mean um secondary sources are secondary sources uh primary i mean that's and you know the problem is also that in our country there are so many vested interests that our secondary sources are vitiated very Often vitiated <laughs> exactly not correct so you're going to be just misled. You are going to be, you know, walk down the garden path if you read correct. that. Correct, correct, correct. Very true. Um, in fact, I was reading this book. I forget the name of the author. Uh, again, an Englishman who wrote about the, the original, the first Firangis who came to um, the foreigners, the first foreigners. He calls them the original Firangis or something. I'm forgetting the name of the author. Uh, and uh, of course, the research seems to be very authentic. But again, there's a lot of uh, glorification of the Mughals, uh, you know, again, the, the, the typical uh, glorification of Akbar and the secular uh, courts yeah. and things of that nature that we have been fed for so many years. Honestly, so, Pudita, it's sickening. I've stopped reading such books. I, I cannot read them any longer. <laughs> they, are, they are so far from the truth. There's so much embroidery. Mm. There's just, just a, a falsehoods are embroidered beautifully into a tail and then packaged and sold beautifully and they sell a lot and it's just sickening. Sickening. Very true. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm using slightly strong language, but I'm being honest. No, no. I think uh, we need that kind of honesty today. And that's why we have our channel and channels like ours, which are get, gaining popularity because... We want people to call out on this uh, false narrative yes. that has been uh, fed down our throats. We've been force fed on this uh, yes. for so long. Yes. Um, it's important to know. I mean, see, there are a lot of times there are certain things maybe unpalatable about our history, but it's good to, um, but not everything like, you know, uh, it's good to have a unprejudiced, unbiased view. At the same time, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we believe everything that we've been told over the years by a certain group of historians, a certain group of with vested uh, academicians. With vested you know, do you remember in that infamous uh, National Integration Council? No, I think you're too young. There was something called the National Integration Council, which used to vet all history books so that they were secular and contributed to national integration. Oh. It was set up by the Nehruvians, this oh. National Integration Council. And you will find a lot of old leftist historians tom-toming with great pride that, mm -hmm. yes, I was part of it. And I did write that book so that, you know, we could put forward our secular views and we could put forward, push forward national integration. What is the harm in that? Yes. What is the harm indeed? 
No, in fact, uh, there are people who still uh, uh, cling to that. I mean, it's it's shocking. It's astounding when the whole world. I mean, there's a there's a whole section of the country that is rising up to this uh, this glaring uh, the, these glaring omissions and commissions of of the uh, you know of the so-called uh, great leaders of our eminent of historians. Our, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Call them eminent historians. But then there's still people who cling to these. Uh, these. Uh, no, I the problem them. also is Pujita that this is what we are still taught in our schools. So we exactly. grow up learning this, and what you learn in school, you do not unlearn very easily. True. True. Very true. School, college, it's just the same narrative. Mm -hmm. I am from Delhi School of Economics. I've studied sociology over there. Why was it that we were never taught the Indic view or the indigenous view or any Sanskrit texts? Why was it always Radcliffe Brown or Andre Bete or, you know, uh, Louis Dumont or some X, Y, Z who said something about our country? Yeah. Why did I not hear Portillier on the caste system? Correct. He writes a lot on it. I mm -hmm. know about it now because I've read it myself. My sociology um, master's degree did not teach me. It only taught me about lots of dead white men who said a lot of stuff about us and then we're still studying. Correct, 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 correct. Very true. A very true. lot of this has to change. Um, what do you think about being a woman, a strong woman, an author who uh, speaks, um, you know, um, uh, strongly about so many things, especially history, and is attempting to uh, not rewrite but but bring about a new perspective in how we uh, we we understand our history? I would also say rewrite, Pujita. Some things need to be rewritten. Right. <laughs> of course. Of course. I agree. Um, so, what is your what is your thought? What are your thoughts on the so-called feminist uh, feminist movement? So, uh, uh, up front, I completely and fundamentally disagree with feminists. Feminist okay. ideology is an import from uh, a totally alien system. It Correct. started with the chaos in Europe. Started mm -hmm. around the French Revolution. It mm -hmm. is centered around the issues and problems faced by Christian European women. Mm. And often it does not have a clue about anything else. Mm. So uh, the first wave came, there were things like, you know, suffrage, things like right yes. to work. Christian women did not have any rights over their own body, over their own children, over anything at all. Now, this is not true of all women across the world, but they have universalized mm. the experience of Christian European women to the entire world. Correct. It is something, you know, and our academics is so, academics is me too. If something happens in Harvard, then people in Delhi University will rush to do it. Correct. So it's really, um, there's, there's no originality. There's no thinking. Indian academics is in a very, very deep and sad and dark. Home. Very, very. And it's not uh, doing anything new to understand our own society. After all, what is academics for? It's not just so that you become a professor and you earn a salary. You are to throw light on society. You are to look at our own problems in our own way. Now, we have a lot of women uh, in India who face a whole set of problems. But can we understand those set of problems and find a solution for those set of problems in feminist ideology? No. In fact, I do a lot of work on this and mm. uh, again along with indica we just had a conference in guwahati the mm. entire focus of that conference was to look at women the indic way mm. to look at women in our own way i don't like the word feminism but for the moment i use the word with a prefix indic feminism mm. or maybe indic femininity mm. indic femininity and indic women have a strong core of strength Mm. That strength is missing in any other culture. Correct. We don't we don't live in an ideal society either today or ever. But if we are to compare ourselves with other societies, our situation was much, much, much better, even during the time of the Arthashastra. In fact, mm. Ujita, if we were just to go back to the way women were treated in the Arthashastra, we would be living in a kind of paradise. Wow. In terms of security, in terms of rights. Uh, Portillo also, by the way, uh, allows for divorce. A kind of divorce by mutual consent. Oh, very interesting. Yes. So uh, the Arthashastra on women, if we could, you know, 
even put all those principles to work today we would be very much better off because mm-hmm. what has happened to us is that a lot of our own hindu indic ideas have been overlaid by victorian christian and uh, islamic ideas about women very true and it has made an unholy mess but even within that unholy mess as an indian woman i feel so much more empowered secure and of having my own place mm. than the european women i see over here say for example <laughs> france france is supposed to be you know the hub of liberalism progressive <clears throat> yeah. french men are perhaps the most sexist and chauvinist in the entire world <laughs> and it is it is a 50 60% of people who get married get divorced in france so it's impossible to live with a french man and i have some you know french uh, friends so their ideas about marriage and what is their role in the household and what they should do and what their wife should do is just well it makes for wonderful listening and uh, it's absolutely impossible to do correct because you think that if uh, she does all the work and you know every friday they bring her a bunch of flowers and say something nice that's enough don't need to do anything else correct so the sum and substance is that femininity a feminism has also evolved into something which has become absolutely toxic Correct. it has become aggressive toxic and it is my life's mission to wean young women back from toxic femininity toxic feminism to indic feminism where we don't think only about me 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 but <laughs> yes me in the context of family and society correct it's not just uh, you know i am not the center of the world and it's just not just me who matters but everyone in my family in society matters so this kind of selfishness this focus on me 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 i'm afraid it has got out of hand it scares me very scary when scares me in fact uh, sumedha ji i'm so glad you spoke so eloquently on this because as you were speaking there were so many so many thoughts that were buzzing in my head so many uh associations uh you know um, for example the kind of uh routinely how you know the images uh that we are bombarded with uh, in popular culture uh for example the movies that are being made lately uh, even in regional cinema you find that the moment you want to portray a city bred young woman and you want to show her as being strong or empowered you have to show her with a cigarette you have to show that she parties and hard and parties late Uh, and she is uh, sexually promiscuous yes. um, not that i have a problem with any of these three but my point is why is this being put up or projected as the ideal strong empowered role model yeah as a role so you know uh, you know i always wear sarees correct sarees are uh, the ultimate sign of being a regressive woman apparently <laughs> so if you wear a saree you're just uh, stupid old fashioned yeah. you don't know anything Yes. So I don't get it. What I wear is not what I am. What is inside here is different from what I'm wearing. Correct. But you kind of associate something with something and then you uh also try to say that you must never wear a saree. Now I have worked for the United Nations and I have always worn sarees and gone to the office. Correct. I may be the only woman amongst 1000 people or amongst 500 people in those large meetings that you have wearing a saree but i will be there wearing a saree because that's my dress i feel comfortable in that correct so correct. how can i not wear it so this kind of typification you know in terms of clothes in terms of behavior in terms of language i am not an admirer of abusive language and i never will be correct. i think abusive language is completely sexist correct and it's it just uh, you know um, rains all kinds of uh, sexual violence on people who you don't like so i don't understand why that is yet another marker mm. of the progressive and liberated woman correct 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 very true a very toxic ujita we need to um, uh, speak up against them absolutely absolutely and that, when you mentioned this thing about how uh, in the western world especially in outside not in india do that is changing though um, you know if you go to more um, sort of more sophisticated so called urban environments uh, women uh, the more you know mod- more uh, uh, westernized your attire the more modern you are perceived to be yes um, yes okay. and uh, I, but, but, i read articles about why you should not wear sarees in the office seven reasons why you should not wear correct, a saree in the office correct correct um, in fact 
I remember there was in in an in, in institution that I was working at, uh, we had somebody come and give us a uh, lecture, sort of like a talk on how the woman, the working woman ought to project herself as a strong woman in the work environment. And one of the things, because we are in the South, uh, this lady walked in, uh, if you please, in a short skirt, a tight skirt, not, a, not that I had a problem with that. But she came in and she was talking about uh, how, you know, South Indian women wear flowers uh, and they have a tendency to wear jewelry and all so of all this. All that is, was bad. Yes. All that was bad. Yes. Oh, my God. I love it so much. Exactly. <laughs> so this is the kind of, this is the kind of, uh, you know, uh, these are the kind but of did ideas. Did, that me, did anyone object to this kind of nonsense or no? I did. I did. I did. Oh, and there was another very spirited uh, yeah. lady who along with me said that, but that's our culture. And uh, why should that be a problem? Well, and I feel beautiful when I wear a sari and exactly. I put flowers in my hair. Exactly. I love it. Exactly. So, so our, yes, our, I went to a party with lots of very, very fancy women. So I had just done my puja and I had the, all this chandan on my head. I went right. like that. Correct. Because that's the way I was. You know, you should never, these people who come and give lectures, how can they teach us to be ashamed of things that we do? Exactly. Exactly. So um, but that was uh, that was really, <laughs> you know, a moment where we shared about our uh, experiences. And I think, uh, like you rightly pointed out, as women, it's it's important that we start um, also, you know, denouncing these views when they're put yes. forward to us. Yes, it's very important. Exactly. Um, well, you know, many people will uh, feel things inside but not speak up. So I invite everyone who's listening, please speak up. Yes. When you feel these things as negative and insulting, speak up. Yes. And speak up politely and just tell yes. them that this is something that we do and we love it. It's our culture. It's our culture. No, I mean, there is so much brouhaha in the world about hijab. Uh, that's fine. That's supposed to be their culture. But then you can't wear a sari and a bindi and flowers in your hair. You're supposed to be apologetic about that all of a sudden. So... Anyway, um, so Medha ji, um, what are, uh, as an end note to our, uh, what has been an amazing conversation, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your future projects? Uh, I'm sure. Uh, All right. Explain. So as I said, I am writing this book, Nonfiction History, which is called The Modern Women of Ancient India. I've uh, contracted to write it for Roli Books. Hmm. As soon as I finish it, it shall be published. So that's hmm. my next uh, project. I mean, an already signed project. And of course, there's a book three of these two. Hmm. So that will be the Waters of the Mauryans, book three. Yeah, and other what's books, it called, um, uh, Ji, the third book? The, the Waters book. of the Mauryans. And uh, if you read book two, then at the end of book two, a little bit of an introduction to the next book is provided. Lovely. Other than that, uh, I am also planning to write a short and accessible book about ancient Indian history. Nice. Which will be kind of, you know, like I have a web series, Pujita, which is called Morilok, hmm. in which I look at all aspects of the Saptanga state. Nice. So I'm planning to write a book on that. Okay. I have not as yet uh, signed a contract for it. I'm thinking about, you know, who to do it with and what to do it, uh, what to do about it. But uh, that's something which is at the top of my mind because of the same thing that you ask. People ask for references. Hmm. And uh, I'm afraid that there is nothing I can absolutely recommend without some kind of uh, carry art except of course Sanjeev Sanyal hmm. anybody who really wants something genuine to read please read Sanjeev Sanyal right Sanjeev Sanyal has also been one of the endorsers of my book okay. apart from Amish and uh, Rashmi Bansal right so uh, read his books so I'm thinking of writing that short slim history of ancient history of India for access to people who are not that much into history, but who just like to know something. Correct. Correct. So these are, I think, my uh, three projects right now. And of course, uh, lots of things on the personal front because my daughter is getting married next year. So that's Oh, fantastic. Uh, please accept our congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, looking at you, I, I wouldn't have uh, known that you had a daughter uh, who, you know, from marriageable age. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what's wonderful is um, uh, to uh, to talk to somebody who is an inspiring, motivation, motivating actually, who is um, so complete, 
uh, in terms of um, you know you've had two success i would say two very successful careers as a bureaucrat and now as a full time author a historian uh, and um, uh, you have a family you have children you raise children uh, you know and all of that Ujita, you know i was just being interviewed by doordarshan for this book so they actually did ask me the same question hmm. but do you think that uh, would you ask uh, if you a young woman were to speak to you would you tell her to focus on her career hmm. or on her personal life so uh, having uh, conducted so many different careers i still would say that my personal life comes first Correct. But that's me. Correct. Correct. And that also speaks a lot about um, you know your discipline in terms of um, uh, you know being able to balance the two in a, in in being able to uh, you know. There's uh, some effort needed. There is a yes. lot of effort needed, but for anything wonderful, you need to put in some effort. Correct. correct. Doesn't come automatically. Wonderful. So. Um, Thank you, Sumedha Ji, this for this wonderful conversation that we've had in the last one hour. Uh, time just flew, and uh, I learned so much. I'm sure even uh, you know our viewers learned a lot about uh, the Mauryan period, especially a lot of enlightening facts that came out while we were talking. Um, the Saptanga state and Kautilya, Arthashastra, etc. So um, I think our conversation would kind of serve as a primer for a lot of people who would want to, you know, go back and do a little bit of research, like you said, just to understand more about our history uh, and to get a, a different set of facts than what we were fed uh, while we were in school and you know in other institutions. So namaste, uh, Pujita. Thank namaste so to much. everyone who's Thank been so watching, much. and it was a wonderful conversation, Pujita. Thank you. I think we had. A wide-ranging and interesting and very vibrant conversation. So thank I, you I for agree. that. And uh, our um, best wishes to you and uh, uh, for your forthcoming books and forthcoming projects. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Sumedha Ji. Namaste. Mm -hmm. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanyavad. Namaskar.